Today in Flex in the City, we talk to Claire Marshall, Chief Internal Auditor of Aberdeen, as she talks on being driven by the diversity of thought, being an agent for change, and doing the right thing. All that happening right now in Flex and the City. Hello, everybody. This is Rachel Treese for Flex and the City. And I have the wonderful Claire Marshall. Claire is the Chief Internal Auditor at Aberdeen. And I believe she was born probably 30 miles away, 30 or 40 miles away from where I was born. So um, I think my first guest from the north of England. Lovely to have you on the show, Claire. Thank you, Rachel. So Claire, from, from a girl born in the north of England, ending up in Scotland as a Chief Internal Auditor, love to hear about your story and, and how that happened. Okay, thank you. Well, my story is, I suppose, that I'll start with a, a disclaimer that um, I'm not uh, a career auditor. So that's not how I ended up here. I ended up here starting by being absolutely determined from being a little girl to either be an archaeologist or a lawyer. I decided that archaeology probably wasn't going to do it for me when, um, you know, I'd probably end up in Britain. It rains a lot and actually I could spend an awful lot of my time digging in mud. Um, so I, I quite quickly discounted that. And I went on to do a law degree at Warwick University eventually. By the time I'd finished my law degree, having done some work experience as well, I decided I just didn't want to be a lawyer. And to be honest, I fell into financial services by accident. I had a place to go to, to Brunel University to um, mm. do a master's. I also got offered a place in the Navy to do supply and secretariat. But actually, towards the end of my degree, I decided I would quite like to go back home for a while. So home is absolutely Yorkshire. And I was lucky. I saw a job advertised at the time. It was in the Yorkshire Post magazine. And I saw a job advertised for a private client fund manager. And I have to confess, I didn't really know everything that entailed at the time, but I thought I'd give it a go. If I wanted to stay home, I, I clearly needed a job. So um, I went through the interview process and it was a three stage process. And by the time I finished the um, three day assessment center, I knew I really wanted this job. I grew up in a, a, a really normal household. My dad was a teacher. My mum had been a nurse. Um, and to be honest, I didn't really know that much about financial services. But the idea of being a private client manager and particularly managing money for individuals, for charities, for trusts really appealed to me. So that's, that's how I started my career in financial services. And that was in Yorkshire at the time. Seven years later, I just felt I needed to do a bit of something different. And again, to be honest, I didn't know exactly what that was going to look like. And I saw a role advertised that was a client fund manager. And it didn't say what company it was for. It didn't say where it was. And I explored a little bit about that. And it turned out it was for a company called Standard Life Investments. Mm. Um, and my husband said at the time, if it's in London, you can go by yourself. If it's Edinburgh, I'll come with you. Luckily, it was in Edinburgh. <laughs> So that's how I ended up in Edinburgh working for Standard Life Investments. And that was in 2002. And I've been with what was Standard Life Investments through to what is now Aberdeen in its various guises since then. And, and what did that cover? Crikey, I have, I've been a fund manager, so I've actually managed money. I've done asset allocation, so deciding where money should be for some of the, the large life insurance pension funds as well. I've worked in product I've gone through distribution and then probably from 2010 I would say my roles have been far more focused around governance so I set up a fund governance team that really looked at working with the risk team with the fund managers to make sure that the funds that we manage did what they said on the tin we would be the client representative within that team and to be honest then I was in distribution running a distribution governance and risk team. And I was, I was asked whether this was a role that I might be interested in putting my hat in the ring for. Um, and having checked that everyone was comfortable that um, I didn't have a you know, career internal audit within my background, yeah, I decided that sounded absolutely fascinating after a few conversations. Ultimately, I was successful, here I am. So that was from the start of last year, the start of 2022. 
Fantastic, Claire. And I'm, I'm curious, as, as, as a female in the financial services industry, what do you think has been the greatest support to you and your, 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 your growth? I suppose I'd point to a couple of things, actually. I've been lucky in, well, I'll say I've been lucky, but equally I've sought out people who I could learn from. Um, and I think actually women can be quite intuitive at doing that. So I think sometimes women deal with things in, in different ways. So I've always sought out people that I could learn from. I've been lucky enough to work for some people who have supported me, whether that's been about working part time or picking me out for my leadership potential and ultimately investing in me through, you know, allowing me to go on courses, encouraging that. But equally, I would say latterly, COVID has actually been really helpful for me and probably for a lot of women in that it, it's brought forward that hybrid working that, that really does work. Um, you know, I work hard, but the ability to, to be at home a bit more, I can't say I've not enjoyed. I have loved being able to do some of that and see my children far more than I ever would have. And actually, I think it will both encourage more women into financial services, but also make them stay longer. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Claire. COVID has been a, an eye opener for, for many women um, in financial services and out, outside. Um, I've got a question. We, we had a little chat earlier about um, diversity and, 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 uh, and inclusion, and I know how passionate you are about that. But I know you shared some ideas that you had about really bringing more diversity of thought. So do you want to just share um, that a little bit with the listeners? Yeah, so... Uh... As I say, you know, I, I've gone from the business into internal audit. And, and one of the things that really struck me, having now been in, in audit for over a year, is just the skill set that comes with that. So in terms of diversity of thinking, I think it's diversity of thinking that really helps, whether you're thinking about teams or, or boards, um, you know, or really any unit that you want high performance from, diversity of thought is key for me. So one of the things that certainly my audit committee are very keen that I do is um, encourage talent from the business in the same right. way I've come in from the business into internal audit, but to encourage um, talent to come in to internal audit and equally the talent from internal audit to go out and into the business, bringing that controls mindset. Um, we, we work on an agile methodology. Some of the way we, we run sprints, we time bound things, you know, the, the SME knowledge that comes from being in, in internal audit is really recognized as being extremely valuable back into the business. So that's something I'm, I'm really keen to promote. And, and it really promotes change and transformation, doesn't it? If you've got that kind of ecosystem going on in an organisation. So absolutely. And, and actually, you, you know, being an agent for change was one of the big attractions of this role. I think some people see internal auditors as quite standoffish. Um, you know, yes, we have to retain our independence, but where else other than actually being a, a, a CEO do you get to look across the whole business? Where do you get that breadth of learning? Where do you have the opportunity to influence in so many different ways? Then actually being a chief internal auditor, it's been fascinating. I, I can I can imagine. So so talking about boards, and obviously you have a lot of interaction with, with boards. So I'm I'm curious as to what you see other than that diversity of thought. You know, what are some of the most important um behaviors and, and, and how can we instill more of those important behaviours in, in boards, in, in financial services? I think one of the biggest things for me, Rachel, would be um, I've been delighted by how I've really seen curiosity from the boards that I deal with and, and challenge. I mean, healthy challenge, you know, inviting different parts of the business in. We would talk about the three lines of defence. So you have the business, you have the, the second line, the compliance, risk and compliance team, and then you have internal audit. And I actually think to either get the diversity of thought again or really to, to get some very good behaviours, understanding on any given subject, what are the business doing? How are they controlling that? How does that balance with the growth and opportunities they see? What does the second line think of this area of the business and has internal audit been involved and do they have an opinion? I actually think that's um, a really important behaviour across boards. Um, and I, I think curiosity is huge and being willing and able to to challenge and challenge appropriately I think equally I'm um, not just taking 
information at face value. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So talking about curiosity, you have two girls. I do. How old are they? Uh, uh, nine, nine and 12, or my oldest nearly 13 and my nine year old somewhere around nearly 25, I think most days, but yes. Absolutely. So I'm sure <laughs> lots of curiosity at home as well as in the workplace. So so with, with your two girls, I'm curious, do, do they do they know what you do? Do they know about your, your role? They do. I've always talked very openly to my children and probably never really talked to them as children almost, mini adults. My, my 12 year old is perfectly capable of, of debating various issues I could bring home from, from work with me and I can talk to her in general themes. They, they both know about risk reward. So from a very early age, I've taught them that life is full of choices um, and, and brought them up to be able to make choices and equally understand consequences. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, if you pick something, you probably have given up something in the other hand. So what do those different outcomes look like? And, and what are the things that can help you choose? And I think that's really important because, you know, it's not easy growing up in the world today and being able to understand who you are and the choices that you want to make. I think it's very important. Um, and yes, the girls definitely know what I do. There is a little bit of role reversal, I suppose. But, you know, I still try and go into school and they're, they're very pleased to have me there and they're very proud of, of what I do. Yeah, so, so Claire, the parallels between um, uh, parenting and, and leadership, I'm, I'm sure um, there are some parallels. So as a great leader in financial services and a great parent, what would you um, say the parallels are? I think there certainly are some similarities. So I think my approach to parenting and to leadership are very similar. Um, my, my natural reaction is to coach. I think you could, you could ask either my children or my team and, and they'd tell you the same thing in that I will give input, I'll give options, I'll give support, but it's very rare that I actually tell my children or my team to do something. Um, I much prefer to, to almost help guide them to the answer or allow them to give the options and, and, and let's choose between us about where we really want to take something. That's not to say I can't be directive, um, but I just think if you, take, if you take it from diversity of thought, I'm not always the one with the answers. Some people have amazing answers and actually you get to a much better outcome by learning to listen, giving people the opportunity to input. And then really, I think, you know, if, if you'd said to me, what's my superpower, whether it's at home or at work, it's about bringing the different ideas and abilities together to get the best outcome as a team. Absolutely. So you're really speaking my language, which is all about coaching leadership style and creating cultures of agency, um, which, which can make such a difference to sustainable performance in, in organizations. So talking about young people, if you were to give some advice to a young person who is starting in the industry today, um, what would your uh, advice, counsel or, or powerful question be for them? I think the key thing for me is be ambitious, but don't necessarily set yourself your destination before you've started. Take advantage of opportunities that come your way seek people out I think most people are more than happy to talk to you if you if you're willing to approach people and network and you know watch someone in action and then go to them and say I really like the way you did x how do you do that how do you approach that I think most people will will really give you the input so I would say to young people you know be go-getting don't decide on that destination take your opportunities but equally reach out to people I think sometimes I was probably felt under pressure to have the answer. And I've learned as I'm older, wiser, I don't know, whatever that might be, that you don't have to have the answers. And I think as a young person, go and seek some of those answers, but, but really network um, and, and use others. Have ambition, um, but, but really feel, feel comfortable taking that meandering journey to somewhere because it can really enrich your career and actually your life in general. Mm. And talking about life, Claire, thanks for sharing that. I know that you'd gone through breast cancer in, in, in your thirties and I'm, I'm curious, I wonder, you know, what the wisdom 
of that experience has brought to you um, personally and, and in your career and how it's helped shape um, who you are as a leader today? Thanks, Rachel. I mean, it's interesting, you know, I'm not pleased that that happened to me, but I can certainly look back now and know that it it's made me the person that I am today as a, as a you know, a full person and a leader. Um, I think it's taught me about my boundaries. So um, I've gone on, I've been, you know, so lucky. I've gone on and had two girls. Therefore, some of my boundaries with work are around going home. I like to do bath and bedtime. I don't mind working early. I don't mind working late, but I've not been lucky enough to, to have two children to not see them. I think as well, it's it's just taught me about making sure you enjoy life to the full. You you just never know when things are going to change. And perhaps one of the biggest things for me would be that sense of perspective. You know, even still at work, something that's going wrong can feel like, you know, the world is ending. But, you know, taking myself away from it for a few moments, I can soon bring back a, a sense of perspective. Um, I think that's huge. And the other thing for me would be resilience. And I probably didn't realize how resilient I was having gone through what I have until I was having some discussions prior to, to really putting my hat in the ring for, for this role. And one of the points someone made to me was how lonely it can be being the chief internal auditor, because you're not really part of that exec team that are trying to, you know, grow the business, talk together about all the opportunities and, and drive. And, and to a degree, you, you have to be able to check and challenge any one of that executive team. And ultimately, my, my direct reporting line goes into the chair of the audit committee, who is an external non-exec director. And I realized that I was able to say quite happily when someone said that can be a lonely place, that I faced into loneliness. So you know, whether you have the best support network in the world, if you go through something um, like a, a cancer or something else like that, you make decisions and you realize at the end of the day, you have to back yourself and whatever choices you make, uh, you have to be ready to accept the consequences. So I think, I think to be honest, it's made me more resilient than, than I ever would have been had I not gone through that. Thank you so much for sharing, um, Claire, because I think this is an important um, topic to share with, with many listeners out there. So thank you for sharing. Talking about values, um, and, and clearly um, that experience has given you value. What would you say your, 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 your values um, are, Claire? I think, to be honest, I, I probably ended up being put forward for this role because I'm actually known for doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. If you um, look at my career, it's been very varied, but ultimately it's about client outcomes. And that's really why I get out of bed every day and, and come to work. It's around getting to the right outcome. And that's not, a, that's not always the fastest way. It's not always the easiest way. But I would say I've definitely got a moral compass about trying to do things the right way, get the right outcome. Absolutely. Um, and talking about right outcome, when you're not um, being a fabulous um, mother and, and wife and working hard for the job you do, is there anything else that uh, lights your fire um, that you love doing? <laughs> um, I have to say I'm, I'm quite a, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with my family. Um, so, you know, regularly swimming. Um, I, I love skiing. We don't do that as much. Um, I was sensible enough to marry a chef. So again, love food, family meals, um, a drop of wine. Um, but one of my big passions, and especially um, at this time of year, Rachel, has to be my garden. Um, I think sometimes if you work in financial services or, or similar, it almost seems endless and you, you you very rarely get a chance to to look at something and think I did that and have five minutes to dwell on it before you're into the next you know issue whatever that might be or or the next project and I actually love my garden because it gives me time to really plan and create and then to be honest just enjoy the the fruits of my labor so um I love particularly um, growing flowers. We've got fruit trees as well, but I, I love growing flowers. Um, and, and I do that to, to cut and put in vases around the home to give 
to presents for people. Um, and equally, my husband does photography with some of the flowers I've grown. And what, what's your favourite flower, Claire? Um, I love dahlias. There are so many different types. You get so many different colours. You can combine the colours. And I love the fact that they have different shapes. You know, you get round, soft shapes and then some spiky ones as well. And I just love putting all of those together. Fabulous. And so so my last question, what can financial services learn from the beauty and magnificence of the dahlia? <laughs> um, let's go with two things. Um, in the same way that I love putting those dahlias in a vase and creating the, the, the right bouquet, build teams, put together the different um, skill sets, put together um, you know, the, the different thoughts and, and really create that outcome um, by taking the, the diversity. Um, and I think secondly, take a moment to, to bask in the glory and, and, and look at what you've achieved. Just take a moment. So I'm hearing create a beautiful bouquet and celebrate. Absolutely. Well put. Claire Marshall, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a fantastic podcast and I know our listeners are going to absolutely love it. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you for having me. You just listened to Flex in the City. Catch us on our next episode.